Thanks everyone so much for tuning in. Welcome to our launch of the State of Digital Rights Report, which is a 2021 retrospective. Uh, my name is Sam Floriani and I am the program lead here at Digital Rights Watch. Uh, before we go any further, I do want to acknowledge that Digital Rights Watch works on the stolen lands of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Um, I'm personally tuning in from the lands of the Wurundjeri Wurrung people. And so on behalf of Digital Rights Watch, I just want to acknowledge that sovereignty of this land was never ceded and pay my respect to elders past and present. I also want to do a quick shout out to uh, Tom and to ThoughtWorks for hosting us in Zoom today and for lending a bit of technical assistance behind the scenes. Uh, means a lot, so thanks, thanks for all your help. Um, if you are tweeting or on social media or any of that stuff, uh, tag us on, on Twitter while you're, while you're tweeting. We'd love to uh, see what you have to say. Um, you can find us at D-R-W-A-U-S. Um, we'd love to, love to see what you have to say. So now that that's done, Welcome. Uh, so each year we invite a range of people to reflect upon and analyze the state of digital rights in, in the previous year. So we then collate all of these perspectives into one report, which is what we're thrilled to be launching today. Uh, so we do this in a spirit of reflection and documentation, learning, and also to contribute to a growing digital rights movement in Australia. So we really want to see a robust and nuanced public debate about digital rights in Australia. And so we collate this report as, you know, part of that objective. So this year we had a wonderful collection of activists and technologists, writers, lawyers, and academics all contributing to the report on a range of different topics. So I just wanna shout out a huge thank you to all our contributors. So Catherine Gladhill Tucker, Lily Ryan, Tom Solston, Dr. Jake Goldenfine, Gala Vanting, Lauren Kelly, Lucy Kralkova, Kieran Pender, and Dakshayini Suryakamuran. So thank you so much for all of your contributions. I really hope that people will go and read the report and I encourage you to do so, we'll drop the link to the report in the chat. Um, you know, I also want to thank these people for all of their ongoing contributions to this space. The digital rights community in Australia isn't huge, uh, but it is full of some really wonderful, intelligent, um, you know, really passionate mm -hmm. people, Ooh, that's my speaker just turning off, <laughs> who are dedicated to, to this movement and to growing it. And so uh, we hope to be able to continue to support and encourage uh, people like you and, and others in the community. So yes, please go and read the report in full. I'm not gonna ask the speakers to delve too deep into all of their individual pieces. Um, if you want that, you will have to go and read it. So, you know, no major spoilers here today. Okay, to kick things off, I want to invite Lizzie O'Shea to come and say a few opening words. Uh, you will probably already know Lizzie as a writer, lawyer and activist, and she's also the chair of Digital Rights Watch. Thanks, Sam. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks so much for coming. I'm always really excited this time of year to see what this report looks like and to get it out into the world. The idea is really to create a set of accessible essays that highlight the key points in the last 12 months that we think are really important uh, in the advancement and sometimes the regression of digital rights. Uh, and Really, I'm thrilled this year uh, because I think it gives voice to that sense of accessibility. The essays are really good to read. They're engaging and interesting. Um, and even someone who spends a lot of time in this space, I felt like I learned a lot. Uh, it's also reflective of the diversity of people who are interested in these kinds of topics, uh, whether they're from different walks of life or different skill sets. I think that's a really important aspect of this report to highlight that we want a movement that is diverse, that welcomes people from different parts of society, whether that's industry or civil society or academia to contribute to growing the space. Uh, and it's such an important initiative, I think, because our adversaries are extremely powerful. They are the tech industry and they are the Australian government, as well as their allies around the world, who are making the kinds of decisions that we have to deal with every day as digital rights activists, but also as users of digital systems. So 
these kinds of discussions that are hopefully accessible and diverse are really important to taking back power against these really powerful adversaries. I also wanted to say thank you to Sam uh, for assisting to such a great degree to collate this and make it happen. Um, Sam's a tireless and energetic advocate and we're very grateful to have her here at Digital Rights Watch. Our former ED, Lucy Krelkova, who's recently left us, but still obviously a friend of the organisation, who also worked really hard on this report. James Clark, our new ED, which we're very excited to have. If you haven't met him, uh, feel free to introduce yourself to him. And of course, the terrific contributors, which I'm excited to hear, many of which are in the room now, and I'm excited to hear from them in a short while. I did just want to offer a couple of brief thoughts on what the last 12 months have looked like from Digital Rights Watch's perspective before then handing over to others who've penned essays in this report. I think it's fair to say it's been pretty busy. I counted a very large number of submissions that Digital Rights Watch alone had put forward, but of course, uh, many different civil society organisations have also been contributing actively to policymaking in this space. And it's quite clear now that the idea of regulating technology is not something that's just talked about among activists or people on the fringes of politics, it's now very much part of public policy making uh, for both better and ill. And I think that presents opportunities and challenges for us. We've seen unprecedented new powers introduced for law enforcement and intelligence agencies, which unfortunately I feel like is a bit of a um, common reflection at the end of every year. And then also we've seen, which I think is perhaps a bit novel, some pretty bold moves from tech companies who aren't getting their way. And that, is perhaps a development that is somewhat new, as I mentioned. And I'm particularly thinking there of um, the Facebook news ban, which happened just over a year ago and did cast these power dynamics into sharp relief. The major theme that I took out of this report or, or the way I tried to tie it together is to talk about the idea of safety. I think it's clear that many people experience online spaces as being inherently unsafe, whether that's women or children or people working in the sex and adult industries. Um, routinely, our democratic structures are put at risk. Uh, 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 their safety is compromised by disinformation. Uh, and people who are forced into the margins uh, that are often susceptible to rights abuses, particularly migrants, are subject to really dangerous and discriminatory technology on a routine basis. And what we are seeing is advanced technological systems replicating practices of imperial powers of centuries past by essentially obliterating difference and diversity and treating people as a mass from which you can extract value rather than a community of people with agency and desire to shape their future. And so what we have then is digital infrastructure that doesn't really meet our needs as a society. Um, and given that we are now more required to be online than ever before, to access welfare, to access education, to talk to our friends, to keep in touch with our family. I think this task of making these spaces safe uh, and what that means is a really urgent one. And this is where I think some of these essays really contribute to reshaping both that question and posing some answers. At Digital Rights Watch, of course, our preferred frame is to talk about empowering people in technical terms and social terms and political terms. Our framework is to think about human rights as being the vehicle through which we can reclaim power in digital spaces as against our adversaries. Uh, and that involves seeing people as interesting, diverse, unpredictable, uh, having agency and giving them the opportunity to exercise that agency. And that's really what it means, I think, when we talk about rights holders, uh, giving people dignity and agency in online spaces. So that includes the right to privacy, of course, but it's also the right to digital security, freedom of assembly, the right to self-determination. And so human rights framing is a very useful tool for figuring out how we can shift some of these power dynamics in the 21st century. And I think these essays all touch on these topics in really interesting and novel ways. And I'm really thrilled to see these contributions um, off, often applying a human rights lens, but doing so in ways that I wouldn't have done, but I'm really glad to see happen. And that's what I think is the foundation of a really strong movement. Uh, and I'm really thrilled to bring this into the world. Uh, I would say we are very interested in building a community over the long term. We're interested in hearing your feedback. We're interested in lots of people reading these essays, even if they're not um, people who would consider themselves part of the digital rights community. 
one of the things we try to do as much as possible is make it clear that you don't need a computer science degree to know that digital rights are important and to be part of our movement and people with different perspectives are very welcome and we'd be really interested from hearing what you think about this report and how it might be relevant to you or what you might think might be missing so that we can take that feedback into the next year as well. Um, so please do read and share it. Um, please do come back to us with your thoughts. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from the other contributors today. Thanks, Sam. Brilliant. Thanks, Lizzie, for those opening remarks. I feel like that really sort of sets the scene so well for the report and for this discussion and just for the whole vibe, I guess. <laughs> Um, before we move into the panel discussion, I did want to throw a question to you, Lizzie, um, quickly, which is essentially after looking back on 2021 and even years previously, what are you expecting to see from 2022 or beyond and, and what would you hope to see? Yeah, well, 2022, of course, is an election year federally, and our experience at Digital Rights Watch is that usually comes with uh, pretty active um, policy making. Uh, you know, what we've seen is that politicians often like to give big tech a kick when it suits them politically to do so, while also preserving their capacity to build a surveillance state that can manage and coordinate their citizens in a way that they choose. So. Equally, on the other side, you can have big tech companies who wish to make certain kinds of policies or take political positions um, or sometimes fail to do so. And then I think often vacating the very important space of decision making in respect of digital spaces and, um, you know, our, our capacity to engage in them. So 2022, I think, will be full of lots of different proposals for tech policy many of which are not good. And it's really important that we have a diverse movement that's able to criticise them, that is able to coordinate people into not giving into a sense of, say, privacy fatalism or an expectation that government is entitled to know everything about you in order to keep you safe. Um, but then in fact starts to say and reshape this idea of safety towards one that is based on rights, that's based on respect for people's autonomy and right to organise as communities. And so I really feel we've got an opportunity to reframe that idea of safety away from ideas of censorship and, um, and you know, policing towards an idea of rights respecting technology and autonomy for people and communities. And that's what I would hope to see. And I'm optimistic that we can get there because the terrain is there. There are people who are interested in this topic. And I think if we continue to organize and work together, we can reclaim some of this space away from, um, from companies and governments who don't have our best interests at heart. Yeah, brilliant. I, I love just a little little sprinkling of optimism in, in what is often a really bleak space to, to work in. And I'm sure that, you know, many people in the room are feeling probably pretty burnt out after the past couple of years. So it's nice to be able to, yeah, keep sort of coming back to that that uh, sense of optimism and and um, faith in, in our community to and uh, the digital rights movement to be able to keep fighting for that. I love I would that. I would totally agree with that, Sam. I mean, I am definitely optimistic. You know, <laughs> I've got that Gramscian idea of uh, pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the will. But I think it is actually really important because part of the reason I'm interested in digital rights, and I'm, I'm a lawyer and a writer, I'm not a technologist, is because I do see technology as being part of our future in an optimistic way. It's part of building a movement that can actually respect people's rights. And we can't leave this to others to make calls on. So I am really optimistic about the future of technology. But that's because I think people working together as movements is how we wrest power away from those who are less interested in helping us. So ever the optimist, that's me, um, but hopefully not in a naive utopian way, yeah. one that's grounded <laughs> in a commitment to building a movement and um, hopefully others will join. Beautiful. I would just also add that if, um, if you have any thoughts or comments or questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. Uh, we do have a pretty full agenda, but I, if I see any questions pop up, I'll do my best to, to um, bring those in as well. So feel free to, um, yeah, get stuck in, in the chat if you'd like. So 
Now let's move into the, um, the panel part of this event. So I'd like to introduce our speakers who have amazing and impressive and wildly intimidating bios who, and I'm not gonna read out their full, their full CV for you because um, that would take forever, but also you can look them up and you can read them yourself. But I will introduce our, our speakers who are all contributors to this report. Uh, so we've got Catherine Gledhill-Tucker, who's a Noongar technologist, activist, and writer. Uh, they lead the First Nations Delivery Centre at ThoughtWorks and are the vice chair at Electronic Frontiers Australia. We've got Lily Ryan, who's a software security engineer. She's a board member of Digital Rights Watch and one of the hosts of the radio show Bite Into It. Um, also the OWASP OWASP, I'm not sure if you say that, o yeah. o Wasp Dev Slop web show, which is a mouthful. Uh, Lily writes and speaks about software, security, history, uh, privacy, and all kinds of other digital rights issues. We've got Dr. Jake Goldenfine, who is a law and technology scholar, <clears throat> pun me, who researches data governance, digital platforms, and surveillance regulation. Uh, he is a senior lecturer at Melbourne Law School and associate investigator at the I ARC Center of Ex <laughs> ARC Center of Excellence for Automated Decision Making and Society. Also a mouthful. And we also have Gala Vanting, who is a writer, speaker, educator, sex worker, and advocate for the rights of sex workers. Uh, she is also the National Programs Manager of Scarlet Alliance. So welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for being here. Okay, so I think a really good place to start is if we can cast our minds back to the very beginnings of 2021. Um, Lily, Lily, Lizzie, sorry, uh, alluded to this in her opening remarks. Um, back when the news media bargaining code was really sort of gripping us uh, in, in public controversy and, and heated public debate. Some of you might remember the Facebook news ban was um, a particular moment which really saw um, Facebook and Google and the government kind of go head to head over this piece of policy. So, I'd like to start this by, by turning to Jake, who wrote a piece about, about the news media bargaining code for this report. Um, and in your piece, Jake, you argue that the news media bargaining code actually entrenches platform power rather than challenging it in a, in a meaningful sense. Can you give us a really quick reminder of what the code is for those who, you know, it's been a long year um, and what you mean by, by that? Sure thing. So firstly, thanks for having me um, and thanks for inviting me to contribute to uh, what looks like a brilliant uh, report. Uh, I'm coming to you from unceded Wurundjeri lands and I want to uh, pay my respects and also just thank everyone involved with uh, DRW for all the work you do. Um, so yeah, last year, Facebook did their news ban. Uh, serendipitously, I was teaching my class on platform regulation and specifically the day of the, about the news, the draft news media bargaining code, the day that happened. <laughs> and it was uh, <laughs> quite an amazing thing to be, to be going through. Um, so very quickly, the news media bargaining code is an output from the um, Australian Competition and Consumer Commission's Digital Platforms Inquiry, which is basically a policy framework for uh, addressing what they consider to be um, power differentials in various platform markets, the, the market between platforms and content producers, the markets between platforms and advertisers, and the market between uh, platforms and consumers or, or technology users. And the news media bargaining code was about intervening in this uh, relationship between professional news media organizations that created expansive professional content and platforms, because the news media organizations were arguing that, hey, the platforms that uh, you know index our content on search engines or show it in feeds or, 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 you, or display it through aggregators, they're getting advertising revenue when people discover our content. Our content improves those services. So we should get some of that advertising revenue. And the uh, platforms, on the other hand, said, well, you know, we're actually making your content far more discoverable, uh, far more accessible. Uh, you actually make a whole lot more money because of us. 
all of this, these various claims are very difficult to demonstrate empirically. Um, uh, but ultimately, in, you know, there was sufficient political will to address this issue. It had been addressed in Europe previously through a different mechanism using copyright and creating additional sort of property right in snippets and hyperlinks uh, that then platforms would be forced to license. Australia instead decided they were going to introduce a bargaining framework to force platforms to come to the table and negotiate full commercial remuneration to, to display their content on their services. And the news media bargaining code was the result. Do you want me to talk about what it did or yeah? <laughs> yeah, yeah, just I guess a bit more about, yeah, this, this idea of how it entrenches Ah, right. Yeah. So, um, you know, one of the strange things that happened after the Facebook news ban and the law was passed is that everyone seemed to claim victory. The government was like, look, you know, look at us standing up to the tech bullies. We didn't back down. We've got these law passed. On the other hand, uh, when you look at what happened in the final amendments to the law that came up, after the Facebook news ban, you're like, hold on, this looks very kind of different from what was originally proposed. So uh, trying to pass through, sort of pass what had happened, I had some really uh, wonderful research assistants help me. And we started tracking through the various kind of policy ideas in the news media bargaining code, all the way back through to the original um, policy documents for the, the digital platforms inquiry. And we tracked every submission from every stakeholder and coded them up with respect to what they were saying about these particular issues. And what we sort of saw was that initially there was this real kind of holistic regulatory ambition to create meaningful regulation of, of platforms. And I say meaningful regulation in very much like an economic ACCC regulated industries market focus kind of way, but nonetheless, some sort of meaningful regulation that would have involved things like transparency to a regulator, ongoing market oversight and things like that. And when you look at what happened to the new, like to these policy ambitions all the way through to the end of the news media bargaining code, you see that uh, the, the platforms managed to extract every, really every transparency obligation that had been proposed. And this is transparency around uh, data flows, transparency um, around how their algorithmic curation systems work, uh, transparency that would have been required to, for a regulator, and transparency into the thing that really everyone cared about, which was the relationship between data flow, human attention, content, and economic value, which is the opacity of which is really fundamental to, to platform business models. And so in the end, what you got, you know, on one hand, people were saying like, this is Murdoch media leveraging their political influence to extract rent out of platforms. And that, you know, I was never satisfied with that definition of what was going on because I knew from looking in 2017 that Murdoch wanted to be a, 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 an ad tech platform and not just a publisher. And this was kind of part of their push to that. So I thought that was kind of inadequate explanation. And the way I uh, think of it now having looked at all this doc documentation and looked at all the submissions is that it was really the platforms leveraging cash payments to media companies in order to entrench regular like through regulation entrench their business model that um, enabled them to discriminate that is uh, rank and and differentiate content according to their own commercial priorities to you to, to run this content through their own commercial infrastructures through things like Google News Showcase and, and, and Facebook News and effectively centralize themselves as um, news content intermediaries. So there was nothing in the regulation that challenged any part of their business business model. In fact, it really kind of um, regulated to, 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 to centralize those business models in exchange for cash. And so it kind of represents this government like deciding that instead of what was their initial purpose of like, we need to support, you know, the public good that is journalism, uh, which they could have done through public money. They're like, well, let's use the money from behavioral advertising and use that uh, to prop up these news media companies. And now we're seeing some of the outputs, not just those big commercial deals, but also things like uh, Google teaming up with News Corp to start a new journalism school, not in the Melbourne University Journalism School, but in the business school 
right? Where you are going, where we can only imagine what they're teaching people is how to effectively turn audiences into behavioral metrics that you can sell to advertisers, because that is what um, is going to support journalism in Australia now. Yes, thank you for that. That was a really, you tied that all together really well and clearly. That's, I really appreciate that. And I think that that's kind of a running theme that like it kind of laid a bit of the like sort of set the scene for a few more um, pieces of draft legislation um, that sort of played into the same kind of um, ideas of not really challenging these underlying business models or, or structures, but just kind of um, actually kind of entrenching them. And one of the examples that I think is a good one is the online privacy bill, um, which you also mentioned in, in, your, uh, in your piece, but I won't give too much more away about that. But one of the things that that got me thinking about was it, it raised this idea of age verification. So the online privacy bill would require social media platforms to take all reasonable steps to be able to verify the age of individuals who use a social media service. And so this wasn't the only way that the government pushed for age verification, but um, that piece of draft legislation was interesting because it was ostensibly about increasing privacy, um, but wanted to do so by invading privacy and giving more, potentially more, um, uh, information to to social media platforms. I can see I, I can see you probably have a, a, a maybe a conflicting idea there, Jake. <laughs> no, no, I think I think that's right. I just haven't <laughs> thought about it that way. Exactly. <laughs> um, but that does lead us to the next thing I want to talk about, which was which is age verification, which which is continuing to play a huge role in the digital rights space, but really kind of kicked off in Australia a lot um, over the past year. Um, and, and Kat, I'm wondering if you have a perspective on this on this on this topic that you'd like to share. Yeah, where to start? Because, and I'm sure, like in this audience with all the people here, it seems so obviously a terrible idea. Um, this uh, even just the concept of age verification and its obvious security and privacy implications and there are reasons that other countries have abandoned this idea like I know the UK was looking at some kind of age verification tech implementation scheme and threw it in the bin because it was technologically challenging or impossible um, and had enormous security risks, enormous privacy risks. In, in, I, uh, it's one of those policies that is so clearly driven by puritanical ideology, which is, I think, another theme that has been running across not just tech legislation, but most legislation that we've seen in the last, say, eight years or maybe decades, um, and trying to solve a social problem with technology. And I've, I have... I am yet to see a social problem be successfully solved with technology. Um, uh, and I feel like, and I'm not a parent, so I'm not going to, um, I, I don't mean to say like, this is how parenting should work. I feel like mediating access to the internet as a role for parents and not an opportunity for state intervention. Um, but I know like a, a lot of other people here have, will have opinions on age verification. I know yourself, Sam, you've spoken a lot on this topic as well. Um, so I'm very interested to see other people's feelings too. Do any of the other panellists want to, well, we will talk about online safety more broadly in a minute, but does, do any of the other panellists want to jump in about age verification in particular? It is an ongoing issue. I, I think sex workers have been dealing with this one uh, for a very long time. Um, and I think the there are a lot of really important um, kind of cultural nuances to, you know, the appropriateness of uh, a, a, a young person's access to particular types of content. Um, but I completely agree with Kat that, that I, I also don't feel that that is um, a space for heavy regulation. I feel like that is a space where we can enable cultural change through um, through education and uh, and through the creation of tools and I think that technology can be a layer in that response but it really is it, it's a band-aid um, and and it's one that I think the the sex worker community has a huge stake in which I'll talk a little bit more about later yeah Jake um, without commenting on like the the desirability or not desirability of age verification. 
uh, that contradiction that you bring up with respect to it being embedded in the online privacy legislation, I think what that really speaks to is that we've empowered a regulator to deal with this, the ACCC, that, you know, who, its focus is economic regulation and consumer protection and the protection of vulnerable um, consumers, like underage consumers, is sort of part of their understanding of how to make markets work better. And that's fundamentally what's animating so much of this. And so it's contradictory in this privacy legislation that uh, you, you engage in a process that privacy advocates would understand to undermine privacy. But when you conceptualize privacy as nothing but a solution to a market failure between a platform and a consumer, then um, you know, addressing vulnerability becomes a privacy concern. So it's it's like this whole normative reorientation that's happening because of the regulator that we've empowered to deal with these issues. I mean, I would say we also have an e-safety regulator, but I think too often her focus is also on policing and censorship rather than say um, the edu providing educative educational resources for parents, which I think a lot of parents feel a bit at sea about it and then um, don't necessarily have a solution themselves and end up understandably supporting censorship initiatives that perhaps haven't been thought through in the way that we would like as activists. So that's the other thing. I mean, the Air Safety Commissioner talks a lot about how she's one of two in the world and this is a world leading agency, a lot of world leading happening from Australia. But I would like to see um, a greater focus on empowerment, of course, but also education that might actually give parents um, and also people who are young, maybe who don't get on with their parents, tools for how to look after themselves online and navigate difficult questions. Yeah. So I guess on that note, I mean, you brought up the e-safety commissioner. So let's Sorry. jump into <laughs> online safety. It wasn't planned. Which mm. was another major, major um, area of focus across 2021. And again, we'll, all of these things will continue to be, um, I think, things, you know, in this year and beyond. So sort of zooming out from age verification a bit, that sits within this broader sort of context of online safety. Um, so Gala you wrote your piece about online safety from the perspective of uh, sex worker rights um, and you know sex worker organizations like Scarlet Alliance um, you know like Assembly 4 were very active and the sex worker community seems to be extremely active over the past year in this space um, which was amazing to see and to be able to try to like amplify its support. Um, I'd love to hear a bit more of your reflections on the online safety developments over over 2021 um, if you're happy to share what a year <laughs> what a fun delightful year i've never engaged with government so voluminously and i i feel like i probably never will again because this is just going to keep rolling um look i mean i think the big question that sex workers raised around um, around the online safety bill and around all of its implementation is uh, whose safety are we talking about and, and whose safety are we willing to sacrifice um, in order to protect a particular group. Um, and in the kind of uh, targeting of adult content of sex worker content um, that takes place uh, with the um, addition to the e-safety commissioner's remit, um, I think, you you know, sex workers uh, have a lot to lose in that and we have a lot of our own safety tools to lose in that and a lot of those actually have already been lost to um, precedent legislation like FOSTA SESTA in the United States. Um, I think we don't, uh, you know, the, the sanitization of digital space is uh, I think a way for um, platforms to look like they are doing something about online harm um, and you know sex workers and other marginalized people are often the first people to go when you need to look like you're cleaning up the the community or cleaning up the digital streets so to speak um, and you know sex workers are used to that happening that happens in real life as much as it happens in the online world um, I think the really strong resistance to that had in part to do with um, 
like need uh, for sex workers having access to platforms with network effect is really essential to us being able to do things like share safety information um, or avoid uh, law enforcement in places where we're looking where, sorry where we're working in criminalized spaces um, you know it's a place where we share life-altering meme content. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that I think are really important to the sex worker community as a criminalized and stigmatized community um, that were really, that the, the, the government felt really comfortable sacrificing. Um, and we fought really, really hard against that. Um, and we didn't, other than uh, some of our allies in the tech space, didn't have a lot of support um, to do that and didn't have a lot of allyship in so doing. And that felt pretty revelatory to us mm -hmm. um, to see a lot of people be really comfortable um, sacrificing sex worker livelihoods and safety to quote unquote protect children from us, you know, which is particularly hard when many of us have children ourselves or uh, have relationships with young people, you know, like sex workers exist in a community outside of just our sex working identities um, and know how to check them at the door in our relationships with other people. Um, so I think there is a, there's this kind of idea that the presence of a sex worker in, in a space like the internet is inherently harmful. Um, and so that stigma really, really stings. And that was something that we, you know, it's something that we're still coming up against because um, right now eSafety is putting together their age verification for online pornography roadmap. Um, and there are really hard questions to be asked about and hard conversations to be had um, about porn and young people, um, but we're not going about those conversations in the right way. And e-safety is not the place where we need to be having them. We need to be having them in a media literacy space. We need to be having them in a consent and relationships um, and, and sexuality kind of ed educational space. Um, and the, the fact that we lack that so, so deeply in Australian curriculum um, is part of the reason why we're having this, this conversation in the framework that we're having it in. Um, yeah, so it's been an active time and it will continue to be so <laughs> indefinitely, it seems. Yeah, it, it does. <laughs> it does seem that way. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other things that came up, again, kind of under the banner of online safety, but kind of getting a bit like broadening out a little bit, were the, um, I guess, calls to reduce or to restrict anonymity and pseudonymity online. Usually this was framed as, um, you know, people are, uh, it's a, you know, social media is a coward's palace and people are hiding behind anonymous accounts mm -hmm. to harass and bully um, and abuse people online. And so therefore the solution is to get rid of anonymity, which is, you know, a very flawed um, line of logic and a lot of the research that we have, um, you know, the researchers that we've engaged with over the past year have had lots to say about how that's just, it's just not that simple. Um, Gala, did you have any particular additional thoughts about anonymity and pseudonymity that you wanted to, to add in there? I think for sex workers in particular, um, you know, we have a pretty high stake in that conversation. Um, we primarily operate pseudonymously online um, because sex work stigma and criminalization means we have to separate um, our working identities, our professional lives from our personal lives in a lot of situations. Um, and we already kind of, uh, you know, we've seen some of the negative impacts of the uh, of being forced to um, to get rid of those pseudonyms. Um, and and they, that never goes well for us because it really is a safety issue for us. It really is um, a kind of, it, it, it's a high stakes issue. Um, I think the, you know, the idea that also that we're gonna stop trolling by um, making people use their real names is deeply misguided. If you spend any time on Twitter, um, I, I think you know that, um, that, <laughs> that people are perfectly willing to say horrible things to each other on the internet using their legal identities. Um, but I, I think, you know, for us, that is a, that is a, a really untouchable space and to not be able to operate pseudonymously online will push us out of those spaces. Yeah, absolutely. Did anyone else on the panel want to jump in about anonymity and pseudonymity before we move on to the next hot topic? <laughs> Other than just yes, plus one, I think it, we, I haven't seen any compelling evidence that real name policies reduce 
online like trolling or harm or abuse. So I question the framing of a lot of these pieces of like policy and legislation. Um, Facebook is a cesspool, like be and real names have not helped that at all. And uh, people, elected officials will uh, abuse and har harass people in public because mm. they have the power to do so. Um, yeah, uh, on, online harm is not going to be fixed by making everyone use their real names in public. Yeah, and I think that, um, like, kind of calling back to my comment before about, you know, trying to enhance privacy by undermining privacy, this kind of flows through, like, you trying to enhance, enhance safety in some, like, conceptualization of it, but anonymity and pseudonymity is a safety tool for so many people so you're trying to enhance safety by undermining safety it's like make it make sense you know another sort of I guess this is sort of linked in a, in a way to the next topic that I wanted to talk about um, briefly which was encryption that got brought up a few times as well um, last year and it I mean it gets rolled out all the time um, right but it was something that got rolled out as another um, I guess uh, you know, a, an evil that needed to be um, eradicated to be able to, to shine the light on all the bad things on the internet, I suppose, as a dramatic way of putting that. Um, Lily, I'm, I'm curious if you have any any particular comments about, about encryption over 2021. Yeah, uh, I feel like uh, what you said earlier about, you know, this has been something that's come up before. It's really true. It feels like the kind of we had this we had this debate about encryption in the 90s it hasn't gone away um it will probably continue as long as we have it so as long as we have the internet hopefully um but i feel like it really the fact that it is still an issue speaks to the the fact that a lot of people drafting the legislation and thinking about these policies don't actually understand what encryption is um and you know a lot of people in tech think about encryption in one of maybe two specific ways as in it's encrypting data so that you can't read the data or it's encrypting the traffic so that you can't read the data that's going back and forth between people. Um, there are lots of other ways to look at it, but we have encryption for a reason. Um, encrypted messaging is one of the things that seems to be demonized the most, but if we're talking about removing um, encryption overall, you know, encryption is something that banks use, for example, so that you can transact with them and with other people to do business. Um, if we don't have that, then we have serious problems. And I think that the fact, I mean, I, you could talk about this for a very long time as you could with a lot of these topics, the fact that it keeps coming up suggests that we haven't really gotten any more nuance in this debate, except to keep pointing out bad things going on and saying this has this is happening because encryption. Um, you know, encryption supports terrorism, for example. Whereas it's more about, you know, it's a bit like oxygen. Everybody needs to breathe oxygen in order to survive. So by that same logic, you could say, well, oxygen supports terrorism as well because they're breathing it to live. Um, but yeah, it's it's really disheartening that it, it keeps coming up, but I think it's just going to keep coming up for a long time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, while, I've, while I've got you, you and Tom wrote about the census, mm. um, which was, was snuck in there in 2021 in amongst <laughs> everything else that was happening. And there were quite a few issues. Um, I don't want to delve into all of them um, for time's sake and also so people can go and read the report. Um, but you also, what I thought was interesting was that you linked it to national security law and to human rights. Do you want to give mm. us like a really sort of brief highlights reel of, of your take on on that sure yeah the census is a tricky one to sustain activism about because it happens once every five years and five years is well outside of most people's attention spans which is why we hold elections more regularly than that usually um but yeah it's um it's interesting we spent a lot of time campaigning about this in 2016 the last time that it happened because the laws and laws around yeah, the laws around the census changed in 2015 so that it was now possible and required, in fact, for the ABS to retain name and address of census respondents in conjunction with their answers, which had never previously been the case. And um, one of the ways that they, they did that was by giving everybody unique identifiers for these papers that they were sending out rather than just sending out the same form to everybody. Um, 
that has continued. What's happened in the interim has been a lot of campaigning, um, particularly by the queer community, um, to get more information or questions specific to gender and sexuality in the census as well, um, which led to the ABS publishing their own guidelines on how to collect statistics about sex and gender. And what was really disappointing to see was that in the 2021 census that their own guidelines were not followed. They, they issued a question which was about sex, but contained comments or you know, options that were about gender identities instead and sort of conflated the whole issue which was disappointing and also made it very difficult for some people to answer the questions accurately, which, you know, if you don't do, you get fined. So that was kind of putting a lot of people in a bind where you would answer these questions um, and you would talk about, say, your, your gender. And then even if you were capable of giving birth, you couldn't answer questions about childbirth because if your gender was male, but you still had, you know, reproductive organs that let you give birth to a child, you couldn't talk about it. Um, and that was particularly true of the online form where you didn't get the opportunity to skip answers the way you could on a paper form, but also the online form gave you a free text field so that you could put in more information about your quote unquote sex if you wanted to. Um, there were also no questions about sexuality, which was a bit disappointing because um, way, way back in 2017, a million years ago, but also yesterday, same-sex marriage was legalized in Australia. So it would be really pertinent to gather a lot more data about that kind of thing. On the flip side, and where this intersects with national security concerns is the fact that we are identifying people now with their responses. So the government now has this list in the form of you know, the ABS's statistics that connects people with, would connect people with information about their sexuality, which is, difficult in the wrong hands. Um, and ordinarily the ABS would have protections against this and they did when the legislation was passed in 2015 about who could access this information. But since the passage of the um, Telecommunications Act, um, the TOLA Act, that was, uh, that's pretty much not a thing anymore, the TOLA. TOLA gives you or gives the government the ability to look at anything they want anytime they want and nobody can tell you that you have had that happen. Um, the ABS is not accepted from this. So there's really one of the one of the recommendations that we made in our part of the report was that we would really like there to be an exception for the ABS in this particular regard, because the census is a really useful tool. It gives us information that we desperately need in order to make informed decisions about policy that affects Australia and Australians, and the people who live here. Um, and if people are not anonymous, they're less likely to be um, honest with their answers, particularly when you're asking really invasive things about relationship status, about the amount that you earn, and also where you live, which is a really uh, sensitive piece of data for a lot of people. Addresses are definitely something that needs to remain private for a lot of folks for safety reasons. And so having that information out there associated with your identity and accessible to various forms of government is um, or you know, whoever really at the end of the day without any kind of oversight is, is really dangerous and leads to us getting probably not the most accurate statistics, mm. quite apart from the fact that they're not asking the right questions to begin with. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I definitely encourage everyone to go and read, again, read the report and because uh, uh, Tom and Lily d dive into quite a bit of detail in, in all of this and it's really fascinating and um, concerning. Um, and so all of these all of these issues are happening like simultaneously with governments and corporations alike um, who who share seemingly very similar views and approaches to tech policy and digital rights. Um, so Kat, I wanted to come to you. So you wrote a piece um, and you explore the notion of innovation under digital colonialism, um, which I, I guess is a, is a really interesting and great concept to kind of frame a lot of these things under. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Give us a little sneak peek into, into your piece. Oh, thanks, Sam. Um, yes, and this is a big topic and I encourage everyone to read the, the essay that I wrote and the references that I reference. I'm glad that um, JQ talked about the news media bargaining code and 
the the effectiveness of that legitimizing and entrenching power because I, I think I echo that sentiment in in my piece in the report as well and I argue that um, not only legitimizing and entrenching that power but also recognizing some of these organizations and, and private entities as imperial powers and negotiating in a way that we would with a foreign power or a foreign country. Um, so my my working theory is that modern technology is effectively rooted in imperial power that can perform imperial harm, but these new imperialists in our modern day society are populated by you know, Facebook and Amazon and Google, as well as the intelligence agencies of the Five Eyes, where Australia acts as this kind of critical linchpin of global surveillance. So this is all happening in, in one big messy context, even though sometimes it looks like, oh, now we're dealing with undermining encryption or undermining our right to privacy or our right to assemble. This is all about state power amassing more power and using private entities to to bargain those those power dynamics and those relationships um so i think these these layers of our digital ecosystem if we look at software hardware and networks and data they're effectively captured by these imperial powers and it, very effectively in the global south um if we look at I talk a, a quite a bit about Facebook in my piece more than I would like to because it is such an effective illustration of how power is manifested in, in the tech ecosystem. But if we look at the Free Basics um, uh, initiative it, built by Facebook and we look at how they have managed to offer um, networks and devices and access to basic online information um, but it effectively capture the way that huge communities of people are able to interact with the online world um, that's a that's a huge problem um, and these these ecosystems are no longer owned by the people or the commons, and they're captured by companies who have a desire to make a profit. They're not benevolent entities. And I argue that we need public ownership of every layer of this ecosystem. And I argue that those policies and protocols need to be led by First Nations communities too. Like what would those digital platforms look like if they were informed by cultures whose knowledge systems are able to effectively relate with non-human entities and prioritize quick collective well-being and um, champion non-centralized authority, cooperative dynamics, complex knowledge systems and relational incentive and structures. So I think a lot of technology and policy is emerging from uh, surveillance capitalism and it's emerging from an ecosystem of for-profit entities and power and even when we're seeing, uh, I read way too much about Web3 over the last few months than I ever, ever wanted to. And I deeply despise that this is being lauded as the next stage of technical, technological innovation. All of that innovation is still happening under the same protocols and foundations of the surveillance capitalism framework that we have now. And it's going to it, the same kind of emergent harm is is going to manifest. Mm. Mm. Thanks, Kat. That was, I yeah, I really encourage everyone to go, again, go and read the report <laughs> um, because you really delve into a lot of the complexity there, which is really, really valuable. Um, so thank you. Looking at the time, we're coming up to the end. So we've got one question here from um, Travis that I think is a really nice one to, to end on. So we can, I feel like we should go around to the you know, four speakers. Um, and the question is, on that point of liberatory tech optimism, our movement has been stuck on the defensive against big tech companies, surveillance capitalists, and authoritarian governments. What kind of alternative positive future could Digital Rights Watch and the rest of us advance. Uh, what would a more liberatory digital society look like? I understand that's a huge meaty question. Let's do like a <laughs> real sort of quick fire wrap up to leave us all um, feeling hopeful for the, you know, our existence online. Um, let's start with you, Lily. Sure. All right. <laughs> um, I think that one of the things that uh, we've actually, you know, we've got the tools to do that right now. Um, 
in amongst all of the legislation and the discussion that's been going on at the moment, there have been a bunch of reforms and those are still in the works, including reforms of things like the Privacy Act, you know, reviews of that kind of thing and of the, I guess, the infrastructure that's been built up since 2001 to sort of surveil everybody. We have a chance to reset that and engage with that right now which is amazing. And so I would really encourage everybody to think about that and to take that, take that chance to engage while we're doing this kind of reform because it's very fundamental. Beautiful. Uh, Kat. Sure. Yeah, I, am, I hope this isn't too naive. I am quietly optimistic that a change of government could give us an opportunity to um, shake things up a little bit and push some legislation that is a little bit more like prioritizes collective well-being um and yeah again my the drum that I beat is public ownership of every layer of our digital ecosystem I think that's what I'm fighting for yeah cool okay gala (laughs) it's a huge question (laughs) it really is and uh, it I feel like, you know, I try to use opportunities to speak as opportunities to represent sex work and and only sex work, um, because it's not often that that happens. Um, But I I guess the, the, like, it isn't so much a, a, there is no digital solution to um, combating whorephobia. Um, An internet that was safe and pleasurable for sex workers is one where we're not replicating the criminalization of our work and and our lives and the people who we care about. Um, And I think that that attitude itself is the thing that has to be dismantled before we can approach uh, that, that utopic vision. Yeah. And Jake? Sure. I mean, I think the the answers come more from politics than technology necessarily. So with respect to our engagement with uh, privately owned technical systems, I I very much echo what um, Lizzie said earlier. You know, uh, we we need systems that uh, facilitate our civic participation rather than treat us as um, a resource of data and attention to be to be mined and 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 translated into value, and our engagement with government systems has to occur on terms where we can trust that um, those technical systems aren't generating at the same time some sort of you know like governance surplus that can be cashed out in another in another project for another reason. You know, th- if th- if things just did what like government told us they would do and that was it that would be just such a massive leap forward in in facilitating um like public technological infrastructures but we haven't quite even gotten there yet Mm. well on that note thank you all for being able to summarize so articulately those points it's a huge question i put you on the spot there for you know the remaining five minutes so i appreciate you being able to respond to that so well Um, so thanks all of you for coming along and thanks for everyone who's in the audience um again go and read the report there are other contributors who we didn't get to speak much about surveillance today there's quite a bit of surveillance um coverage in the report so please go and check that out um if you're interested in being part of growing the digital rights movement uh please get involved with digital rights watch um follow us on social media but more importantly if you're not already on our mailing list uh please do jump on that because then it enables us to be able to communicate with you without being beholden to uh, big uh, digital platforms. It's really important um, f- for that for that purpose. So you know, the next time Facebook does a news ban, we're not um, left scrambling to be able to communicate with people. Um, you can donate to Digital Rights Watch. This is my not at all subtle um, ask for, you know, please uh, do consider supporting us uh, with support. We're able to continue to do this work and put on events like this and create the, this report and, and whatnot. So please do consider doing that. Um, And lastly, we have very exciting things coming up in 2022. We are currently doing a supporter survey because we don't, we try not to track people around the internet to sort of figure out who you are and what you like. So if you're interested in helping us shape um, this year and coming years, please do um, 
jump in and fill that out for us as well so we can get a better sense of, of what you care about and what you want to see us working on more in the future. Um, that's it. Thanks again, everyone, so much for coming along and for sharing all of your amazing insight and perspectives. Um, please go and read the report.